All right, so we're going to go straight to the Word of God. Um, my message today has been titled Edify. Um, yeah, the word edify means to build up. For in, in the month of August, I'm going to start a new series which I've called Alter Ego. And, um, well, it, it's going to be an interesting teaching, so I hope that all of you will plan to be a part of it. Um, so let's go to today's message. I want to talk about edify. Edify means to build up. And um, really, I chose the word edify because this word has been in my spirit for a long time. I want to talk about to build a nation. What does it take to build a nation? And I want to speak about this before I, I will start this series. Um, to just make sure that our minds are in the right place when it comes to the issues that surround our country. Right now, everybody is talking about the next election, isn't it? And um, the conversation on social media, mostly, um, seems to be tilting in the direction of Peter Obi, isn't it? And um, the word obedient has a new meaning in Nigeria right now, isn't it? All right, so uh, that's what we're thinking. And, and, and as I began to think about this, uh, I wanted to make sure that those of us who are here, we, are, we have the right mindset. And we are able to think about our nation properly. Personally, I always weigh what is happening to us locally in this country to what is going on around the world. You know? Um, and so I look at what is happening in Nigeria, and then, of course, I look at what's happening in the West, America, UK, Europe, and I also look at what's going on in the East, China, South Korea, Japan, um, and, you know, the, the, the big boys. Um, that are playing in, in, in the world field, you, you, you know, even, even India. You want to look at what is going on even around other African nations. But just to compare what is happening, I always like to look at Nigeria from a global perspective. And one of the reasons I do that is because whatever is happening in the West will soon become normal in our country. It just takes a... a Nigeria is highly influenced, especially culturally, by the West. We wear their clothes. We look like them. We make their kind of hair. Many people do not like weaving until an American celebrity started to weave her hair. You know, those type of things. We are heavily influenced by what is going on in the West, especially culturally. And so you discover that their experience become our experience as well. Take, for example, the biggest area where the influence actually begins from is entertainment, isn't it? Music, movies. And you see that what, what the stories in Hollywood is becoming the stories in Nollywood, isn't it? The divorce is getting higher, right? Um, the, um, what is it called? Plastic surgery is also very high. Is high among Hollywood stars. It's becoming very high among um, Nollywood. You know, the issues of LGBT is very prominent in Hollywood. It's also now very prominent in Nollywood. Okay, so we are heavily influenced. Our government also try to speak like, you know, the um, our, our leaders in government also like to speak. They copy what the Western counterparts are doing. And with what is going on in the world right now, it's becoming very dangerous for us to continue to allow ourselves to be influenced by what is going on in the West. Okay? Well, that is a conversation for another day. But today, I just want to really focus on our country, Nigeria. And looking at it, looking at Nigeria from that global point, as well as, of course, I'm locally because I'm here. It, what does it take to build a nation? What does it take to build a nation? The goal of nation building is 
peace and prosperity, isn't it? That's the goal of nation building. You bring a group of people together, find a way for them to live together peacefully, and so that everybody within that geographical you know, um, boundaries can live together and prosper together. That's the goal of nation building. You know, and so what does it take to build a nation? All right, now, for any nation to survive or thrive, it needs about four things. I kind of looked everything into four things. Number one, resources. Every nation needs resources. Natural resources like oil, natural gas, precious stones, gold, diamond, and the rest. Natural resources are required. And for, for countries that don't have natural resources, they also find a way to have some form of resources. Like China, right now, is the biggest exporter of technology in the world, isn't it? Everything technology right now, let me just say 70% of the world's technology is made in China, right? It may not be designed there, they may not have the patent, but everybody goes to China to produce. So you see a product that will tell you, designed by Panasonic, but made in China, isn't it? So, um, so China has become the biggest exporter of technology. So you can say that technology has become one of their resources, isn't it? Um, India, IT, India is big on producing softwares. You know, they have to position themselves in that way, and so on and so forth. Agriculture. Agriculture. I, I, I found out recently that the Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agriculture products in the world. This tiny nation that lives in, you know, by the sea. They are the biggest and second largest exporter of agricultural products in the world. Um, and so they've positioned themselves that way. But every nation needs resources. Nigeria here, we are blessed with resources, isn't it? We have natural gas. We have oil. We even have precious stones. You know? Um, and so on and so forth. Secondly, you need systems. You need systems. Every nation, they have all kinds of systems. Political systems, how they run their, you know, their, their government and their politics. They have economic systems. They have educational systems. You need systems, you know, to make a nation work. There are many systems of government that have come up in the world over the years. One has proven to be more successful than others because, because of Great Britain and America, isn't it? The democratic system. There are other systems that have come up in the world, but they've not really produced the kind of results that America has produced, right? And Great Britain, and nations that practice democracy are the richest nations in the world, the more prosperous and, you know, and they are living in relative peace and prosperity. There are other um, systems of government in the world, but they've not really worked. Many of them have turned against the people that they were supposed to be um, you know, protecting. For example, communism and fascism. All of these systems of government have been shown to be deadly, isn't it? So let's look at the Mao government many years ago in, in the East. The Mao government um, that led China, you know, and all of that place for a long time, killed, in fact, history cannot estimate the exact number of people that was killed by Mao, right? They go in tens of millions. And that was the communist government. Of course, we know of Hitler, which was the reason for the First and the Second World War, isn't it? Stanley for the, of the Soviet Union. All of these guys were running um, on, on communism. And of course, communism failed them because it killed a lot of people, right? Let's look at um, the old Soviet Union today that is broken down into Russia, Ukraine, and all the other um, neighboring nations. The old Soviet Union, led by you know, strongman Stan Stanley, and he was running the government on the idea of communism. Over six million Ukrainians were killed during that period. 
It was a massive genocide. So communism doesn't work. Fascism doesn't work. It doesn't produce a great result. Now, democracy is a system of of government that seems to produce the best result. Of course, it's not perfect, but hey, America runs on democracy, right? And they become the, the richest country in the world. They become the most powerful nation in the world. And so other nations too that have adopted um, um, democracies are becoming some of the greatest nations in the world and the more prosperous nations in the world. So democracy seems to be working. So they run on democracy as a political system. America runs on an economic system that is called capitalism, right? Free market system. Anybody can go to America. You can do any business. It's the land of the free and of opportunities. That's what it's called, isn't it? Because people are free to do business, make profit. They're not encumbered by anybody. You can sell anything you want to sell. And so it's been discovered that free markets, capitalism, and democracy combined together can make a great nation, right? Because it's been proved in the American experience, uh, uh, experiment that this works, even though it's not perfect. It has its flaws. But as for where we stand today, it seems to be the best system of government. But these are systems. Every nation needs systems to run. Also, every nation needs laws. Laws involve the constitution of the nation, the policies that govern all the different systems, as well as the principles by which, you know, they, the, the laws define the rules and the regulations so that people can live together in harmony and in peace. And then, of course, um, bodies are set up when there's conflict to settle those conflicts and, and, and then um, to also prosecute and punish those people who will break the law. So laws are important for any nation. That's number three. Now the last one is people. People. People are needed to run a nation, isn't it? Actually, the, the reason for the other three is because of the people, right? So it is the people who will use the resources, who will who we build the system? They use um, and, and, and create the laws so that a nation will be able to achieve relative peace and prosperity. Okay. So there's a story of a man. Because I want to try to make my point now. There's a story of a man who was walking from home one day, but his four year old son kept wanting to play with his father, and the father was distracted, and so the father decided to keep him busy. And so the father took a paper that had the map of Nigeria in front of it, tore it into like a dozen pieces, and gave it to the boy, and told the boy to put it together. At least that would keep him busy for a while so he can focus on the work he was supposed to do. Three minutes later, the boy came back. He put the map together. The father was surprised. and was wondering, how did you do it so quickly? And the boy turned the back of the paper and then there was the face of a man on the other side so you know what the boy did smart boy he just put the face of the man together and then by the time he turned the other side bam the, the map was put together what's the moral of the story if you fix the man you fix the nation if you fix the man you fix the nation because the people in the nation are the most important and vital part of that nation why it's people who will use the resources. It's people who will build the system. It's people who will create the laws. So people are the greatest risk factors to peace and prosperity for any nation. And this is the issue. We are our greatest enemy or allies. At the same time, we pose the greatest risk. To the, to, to the growth of any, any nation. We pose the greatest risk to peace or prosperity. Not resources, not systems, not laws, people. Now, of course, we know that you need good laws and good policies, isn't it? You need good systems. However, it's people who create the systems, isn't it? It's people who create the laws. 
is people who will manage the resources for the you know collective good of everybody and so people are the greatest problem therefore if you focus on people then we can have a great nation you build the man you build the nation this is why Jesus even though the Jews were expecting the Savior to come they were expecting the deliverer to come but they thought he was going to be a political leader that would del deliver them from the ty tyranny of the Rome of the Romans but when Jesus came, he didn't come as a political leader. He didn't come as a warlord. He came as a teacher. He came and taught people. He set up a school. He was called Rabbi. Because Jesus, and if we will learn from him, knew that to save the world, you don't give them systems. You change their hearts. Praise the Lord. And that's what Jesus came to do. He's called the Savior of the world. He's called the Messiah. He came to save the world. And so he didn't come to set up political systems or economic systems. He came to save people. He came to change our hearts. Because when people change, they do great things. It is great people that manage the resources and make it even better, isn't it? It is great people that build great economies. It is great people that build great political systems, great, great education systems. It's great people who do great things. So if we want to have a great nation... then we need great people. When we look at Jesus Christ, we need to define what winning is for the church and for Christians. And this is where I fear for the church of Nigeria today. Because when we talk about um, what the church is doing right now, and what the church is is projecting as what is the win for Christians, it seems to be based on material wealth, isn't it? And so all of the teachings are, you can make it, you will prosper. All the programs, look at the programs. Go on the internet and hear people praying and speaking in tongues. It's all so that they can have a child, get money to run their business, get the enemies off their back so they can prosper, and all of that stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the win for the church. That's not the win for Christianity. That's not, that's not what defines whether we win or not. Our winning is defined by changed lives whose agenda is to honor God in everything they do. Because it's changed people. People who have given themselves over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, they are the ones who can build great systems, manage resources in a way that it will be for the collective prosperity of the people and create policies and laws that will ensure that those things will continue to happen. It takes change people to build great nations and to manage and sustain and maintain great nations. Look, I have studied why nations fail. I have studied building great nations and i've read some books and some very difficult books to read i mean there's a book written by Lin Kuan Yu. i don't know how many of you have read that book he chronicled how singapore became the nation it is today it's a very big and boring book to read it takes you have to want to write an exam to read that book you know but i've read the book it was hard um and several others they talked about why nations fall. There's an American general that did his PhD thesis on 
why nations fall. And like him, many other authors, they all agree that nations don't fall because of their political systems or education systems. They fall because the people become morally bankrupt. When Rome fell, Rome still had the greatest military in the world. Their technology had no rival. That's why they were able to conquer as far as they did. But the nation fell. Not because they didn't have the, great, the greatest um, 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 fighting skills and, and weaponries and technology at the time. They fell because the people were morally bankrupt. So he said before the nation finally falls, before the economic falls and everything scatters, it's, it usually first begins with a moral failure. So people, people become the greatest factor to whether a nation will rise or fall. Praise the Lord. Are you, are you with me? Are, are you with me? Praise the Lord. All right. And so you need people. But the problem is that people are not great. We are wicked, greedy, selfish. I'm not the one who just said it. The person who created us is the one that told us. And we see it manifest every day. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The wise man. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 28 verse 26, he says, He that trusted in his own heart is a fool. The problem is that we are wicked. And, and let me tell you something. We have good reasons for our wickedness. That's why we do it. And this is why I say that good intentions alone is not good at all. So let me ask you a question. Can Peter Obi save Nigeria? Can he? Let's just talk about this. Let's think about this for a moment because, you know, Nigerians, we are... We're very interesting people. And let me tell you something. We're not different from any other person or any other group of people in the world. We're not. I've not traveled much, but I've been to a few countries. The first country, I, I, when I traveled out of this country, um, when, I, when I first left this country was, I, I went to France, to Paris. One of the first things I noticed as we were driving in traffic um, on, 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 on the roads in Paris was I saw the, the traffic lights. But on every traffic light, you're going to see at least two policemen with, um, with um, their motorbikes. And you see some police cars parked at strategic locations. So I noticed it, and I asked the, um, the, the driver who was carrying us from the airport to our hotel, and I was like, why are they, you know, this police guy? He says, oh, people like to break the traffic laws here, and when they do, they are caught immediately. So those guys are there chasing those people. So I said, oh, they are orderly. No, they ain't. Because they are arrested. Are you getting the point? And nobody wants to be punished. So they stay in line. We are all the same in this world. The same people. So let me ask you a question. Because the problems we have in Edo State, for example, we blame it on Buhari, isn't it? So let me ask you a question. Let's take the education system, for example, right? So you, you, you are in this school. They put a principal there. And in that school, they have, let's just take a random number. Let's say they have 20 classes for the different levels, right? And so you need at least maybe 16 teachers or they're about to run the schools. Assuming you have one teacher for maths, taking the different levels, right? But only six teachers come to class to teach. The other nine have negotiated with the principal that they are not going to come. And then they give like maybe 20% of their salary 
to the principal so that the principal will continue to mark them present, isn't it? So the question is that who loses? The students, isn't it? But guess what? The principal is getting his salary plus 20% of nine other teachers. So he's happy. He's okay. Are, are we together? And guess what? That, princ prin that principal is a deaconess in our church. All right, let's leave the public school, for example. Let's just take private schools. Private schools, they're writing SSC. And then the, the invigilator comes to class. Ask all the students to give him 2,000 naira, and then he puts the answer on the board. So we have people who go to school, they don't learn, they don't pass the exam, but they come out with A's. They bribe their way and they make it 2 1. Let's say he's, he's an engineer, for example. And then now he got a 2 1, he is hired by this airline company to manage their engine. And then he looks at the engine that he's never looked at before in his entire life, but he's got the papers to show for it, isn't it? Because in this country, we like paper. Mm -hmm. I know. Listen. Then the pilot gets this certified paper, and then he carries 200 passengers to their death. Do we blame Boari for that? So we have people who graduated from computer science in this school never touched the computer in their lives. Never. Never. You give him a computer science, say, bring that keyboard from me. He comes into a church and bring the motive. Yeah. Who do we blame for that? Hello? All right, let's not go too far, you know. Let's just talk about those of you who sell. You're selling tomatoes. You put the bad one under. And then you put the, the good one on top. And you sell it for the price of all the good one. We lie so that we can just get a little advantage over others. And then we come to, to church and give tight on it. And even give testimony that God has blessed you. Many years ago, somebody came to give a testimony, not in church, but some, one of our friends was telling us. He said that he works for the, for the government, so they, they gave him money to go do, um, to, to, to do a job, travel on the trip. When he came back, he still had some, some millions on his hand that he didn't spend. And he came to church and gave tight on it. Is it his money? Some of you are shocked and say, ah, but they gave me to do the job now. Okay, see? Is that Boari's problem? Look. I traveled to Canaan land some time ago. Not run by the government, run by people who are living by principle. They had 24 hours light in this country. I stayed there for five days. The light did not blink once. They generate their own power. They do their stuff. By Nigerians as well. In other words, it shows that it's possible if we want to do it, isn't it? The problem is you and I. The problem, and let me tell you something. It is from the people that a person is elected into government. Every country deserves its leaders. Whoever becomes the leader of this country is the reward of our behavior. We can't blame, we can't, we can't blame, we, 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 can't, we, can't, we cannot blame colonization for it. How long will you be free from colonization before you now realize that they have not been colonizing you for over 60 years? We are the problem. You and I. Given an opportunity to do something right, would you do it right? Because the heart of man is desperately wicked. And this is why the, the job of the church is so important. And it pains my heart that even in church, for the most part, we are only teaching people to prosper. Whereas the foundation of the Christian teaching is how to behave.
I say it all the time. Miracles are important. Signs and wonders are important. But the reason for all of these things is so that we can follow Jesus. Because when we follow Jesus, there are just certain things we won't do. There's a scripture that always gets me, it grounds me all the time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. It says, not all who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter my kingdom. It says, many will come to me and say, but I did miracles in your name. In other words, they actually did. Right? Because you can't be arguing with God who knows everything, isn't it? When you know he knows everything, you can't argue with him. So there was something in them that thought they were doing the right thing. There's nothing bad in trying to feed people when they're hungry, isn't it? It's a good thing for pastors to want their members to prosper. Boy, that is noble. But that's not the reason for the church. The reason Jesus died on the cross is not to put food on your table. You don't need to come to church to be rich. You don't need to. There are so many seminars and programs you can attain. They will teach you how to be rich. Legit. And you will be rich. If Christianity is what we need to be rich, then the richest person in the world should be a Christian. But the richest person in the world is, isn't. I heard a Nigerian pastor once say that the richest person in this country should, have, should be a Christian. Because God, you know, I said, that theology is not in the Bible. He didn't get it from the Bible, I can tell you. Let me tell you something. I can play a videotape for you right now of an American motivational speaker. When he's done, many of you would think he's a pastor. And he's not even born again. You know why you, you are getting confused? Because the pastors you listen to and this guy, they sound alike. That's why you're confused. Jesus came to save us. From what? From sin. From a wicked heart. So that we can do right by him. Heaven is going to be a place of joy, isn't it? A place of peace. There will be no sin. The Bible says that there's no Christ. That's why only righteous people will make it. Because it takes righteousness to experience peace and joy. The Bible says the kingdom of God is characterized by three things. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. So let me ask you a question so that I, I don't want you to leave today and get confused by what I'm saying. Does God bless people? Does God provide for his children? Can God make you rich? Does God have the power to give wealth? Did anything I'm saying right now make you believe that God doesn't do all of that? Okay, I just hope you don't get confused by that. That is not the goal. Praise the Lord. Are we together? I was having a conversation one day with someone and we were talking about you know what we can do to reach out to certain groups of people and it seemed to me that in the as we were having this conversation it was it kept saying that the church needs to produce something parallel to make them comfortable so that they can come i'm like are you kidding me no, we preach Jesus to them. We get them saved. We don't even give them anything. We don't owe them anything. Except Jesus. Amen. We only feed them if they are hungry. Not to continue to fuel their greed. Everything they are doing is because they are looking for money. We not give them money to come out of there. No. And we miss the point. And the reason we miss the point is because we... We have come to the point where we believe that money answers all things. Money is the new God today. Oh boy. The church will collapse with the wind of the things that is coming to this, to, to, to this country if we don't start focusing on what the church ought to focus on. 
Many of us will wake up one morning, if it will be wins this election, and then three years later, we're still in the same place. Because one person does not, doesn't lead a nation, doesn't rule. One person doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't sit in the office. The president does not sit. If the president sends somebody a message, and then the person comes back and reports he's done it, and the president believes him, but he didn't do it. What happens? Is the job done? No. Some of us will be so shocked that this country did not move an inch, even though Peter will be one. And then we are, we are going to come back to where we are right now. We need to start to look at this thing very differently. Praise the Lord. Nations are built by people. People who live by righteousness. Unfortunately, people can't live by righteousness because they are dead to anything that is good. That's why Jesus came. Jesus did not come to renovate broken people. Jesus came to raise dead people. Paul says, for you were dead in your sin. But Jesus came to give us life. That's why the Bible says that anyone who is in Christ he didn't say that it's a renovated creature. It says it's a new creature. God gives us a new spirit, a new heart, changes us completely, makes us righteous so that we can start to act from who we are now. Righteous people living for him. The heritage we have, the faith that we have received, this faith that we are carrying, the first set of people that took it from Jesus Christ gave their life so that you and I can still have it today. God wants to raise a generation of people who says, I'd rather be poor because I'm doing the right thing than being rich and a compromiser. That's when this nation will start to change. That's when it wouldn't matter who we elect. This nation will grow. This nation will prosper. But until people start to really change. If you came to church so that you, re you become rich, you're in the wrong place. But if you came here so that God can transform you to become like Christ. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was tempted in every way, but he was without sin. He didn't compromise. That's who the church, Paul, Paul was praying for the church. He says, I bow my knees daily until Christ is formed in you. That's the prayer he was praying. That's my prayer for you too. That's my prayer for you too. You see, we've been doing prayers in this church since we started. When we're leading prayers of let the love of God grow in our heart, the prayer is always... Put the, let, have you ever heard people lead prayers for the enemies to die? Or let somebody just say, you will prosper. Oh my God, yeah, man. Oh, your enemies will die. Yeah, man. You will get $1,000 tomorrow. Yeah, man. <laughs> Love your enemies. Mm. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Mm. Pray that the love of God will grow in your heart. With the hungry. Love can grow after belly food. Ah. Let's get back to what, what is important. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom. All these other things you're looking for will be added to you. Let me round up by saying this. The second president of America in American history, his name is John Adams. He's the one that became president after Judge Washington. And he wrote a letter. Um, I can't remember who he wrote the letter to. But in that letter, I think, I think he was, I can't remember, let me not say something that I'm not sure. But this is a con one of the things he said in that letter was that he says the American Constitution 
will only work if it is managed by Christian people. You know why? Because the American Constitution was written by people who had subjected themselves to the teachings of the Bible. So it's a proven fact. And the same thing with Great Britain, isn't it? The, the British common law is completely based on the Bible. That's why when you read the British common law and you read the Anglican book of, and what they call that, their book or the Catholic book of something, they are very similar. Very similar. So here is the thing. I know for a fact, and not just because I'm a Christian, but I know for a fact that only Jesus can save this world. Only Jesus. And it shows in those who live by his word. You see, Jesus is so powerful that even those who don't accept him but choose to live by what he, he wrote down, their lives will still be better off. That's how powerful he is. Not to talk about those who decide to live for him. So listen to me, church. All members here of Tetra Air Church. Here, here's, here's how I want you to look at this country. That's why this is the reason why I don't tell people to vote. Some, someone once told me, said, Pastor James, you don't, you don't really talk about the politics of the day. That's because I see it differently than most people do. I don't tell people who to vote for, what to vote for. How do you know that Peter B is going to be the one? When everything is still going on the same way? That is really going to change. You'll be shocked. Nothing much. Maybe a few policies here and there. But if we do our job, our job is one, to honor Christ and to spread the word to others who don't honor him. Amen. That's fundamentally our job. Honor him in everything that we do. To serve him. To worship him. Do you know one of the temptations of Jesus Christ? The devil told him he would give him the world, isn't it? Took him to a high place and showed him the beauties and the glory of the earth. He says, I will give you this if you will worship me. And Jesus rebuked him and said, only God is to be worshipped. And guess what? Many people have sold their souls to the devil so they can get the glories of this world. Look, God knows we need money to survive. Amen. That's why people who live by his word, they prosper. And the blessings of God make it rich and it adds no sorrow to it. Praise the Lord. But let me tell you something. If you are choosing to live by the principles of God in a society that is anti-God, you can't prosper there. And if you are poor, that's a good thing. So there are places you go to where poverty is a sign that you are following God. And then there are other places you go to where prosperity is a sign that you're following God. But it's neither poverty or, or, or prosperity. It is following God and honoring him wherever you go. Would you honor him? Would you die for him? Would you suffer for righteousness sake? Would you honor him in everything that you do? Because when push comes to solve and to shove, it is those people who seek to honor Christ that will stand no matter what. Let me say this to you because I wrote this down even though let me just read it the way I wrote it here. You don't know what the leader of a nation faces on that seat. You don't know the pressure he faces every day to compromise. You don't know the offers he's getting from the West or from other African allies or from Russia or China. You don't know the offers he's getting from the rich and famous people all over the world like Bill Gates and those that have the influence he does. 
the personal interests of local and international players in the world make it very difficult to know what to do. And even if you know what to do, you will have to contend with the forces that don't agree with you. So the question is, can Peter Obi save this country? From where I stand, only God can save this nation. If Peter Obi allows God to use him, then we have hope. That's why we continue to pray for our leaders. Because the Bible says that if you fail in the day of adversity, it's not because the adversity was great. It's because your strength is small. And if leaders have not built their strength in God, and they don't have the stamina to have integrity in the moment of choice, let me ask you a question. How much is your soul worth right now? As you're seated here, how much is, will someone offer you for you to lie? For some of you here, it's not much. What you're looking for is not much. But should any amount of money be worth your soul? What about the person who gave his life for you because he had a better plan? Something that is greater than anything this world can offer. What Jesus is offering us is eternal life. Amen. A place where there is peace and joy. In fact, the Bible tells us that the streets of heaven, they're made of gold. That means the things you are pursuing here, you will be matching it in heaven. That wealth that God has runs by righteousness. God is holy. All wealth is his. You and I will face challenges in this world if we decide to do the right thing. But if we create an environment where right thrives, then everybody prospers. And that's what we fight for. I leave the rest for the Holy Spirit to deal with you. God bless you.